All right, good morning to you on this May 23, 2020. We're so glad that you're joining us, the Tempe Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're located here in Tempe, Arizona. Sometimes I hear people say Tempe or Temp. They're not sure how to pronounce it. It's pronounced Tempe, that last E being a long one. And we're right across the street from Arizona State University on the corners of Mill Avenue and Apache Boulevard. So if you ever want to come and join us, which is going to be next week, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit, but uh, we're right here in Tempe. We would love for you to join us as we uh, uh, begin our services next week here at the church. Anyway, so welcome. Um, we're so glad that you tuned in to our church services. And uh, on our screen, we have our information later on this morning. We are going to share your reasons why you're grateful to God, and we're going to share um, what you would like us to pray about, and that is my personal cell number. Yes, I'm publishing it out in public. It's out there for everybody to see, and I want you to text me. Just keep it brief, please, because I go through a lot of texts. Text me why you're grateful or your requests at that number, and uh, at, at that portion during our worship service, I will actually read those live and mention your first name and the and your reasons. So we want to do that, invite uh, you to do that, and uh, we'll have an amazing time with mutual encouragement, our gratitude, as well as our requests. All right, we're going to start off with our uh, praise time uh, right now with Jacqueline. So I'm going to invite her to come on up, and I want to invite you to open up your hearts and your mouths and sing to God with all of your might. Right, Jacqueline? Amen. <laughs> Amen. The words of the hymns on the screen to the right. Um, if you have a hymnal at home, you can also join us by opening your hymnal. hymnal. This morning we are going to sing, Open My Eyes That I May See, <coughs> hymn number 326. So make sure that no matter where you are, you're singing nice and loud. Yes.
praise this morning is hymn number 340, Jesus Saves. So wherever you are, belt out this song, knowing yes. that the heavenly angels are singing along with you. Yes. Jesus Saves. going to be on the screen. It's leaning on the everlasting arms. Jacqueline, 
That was great. You know, and this all the time, but especially in times of stress, uh, there's a lot of people that are stressed out nowadays um, because they're home and they're, they're quarantined at home um, or they've lost their jobs or the pay has been cut. There's a lot of stress, but we can lean on the everlasting arms. Amen? Amen. Jesus' arms are so strong. It's kind of like you ever play that trust game where you just lean back and it's hard for you to trust somebody. As long as you know they have strong arms and they're able to hold you up, well, that's Jesus. We can just lean back and fall on Jesus um, all the time and when things get rough. All right, I want to uh, share. Uh, so welcome, everybody, again, to the Tempe Adventist Church. If you're just joining us, we're so glad that you're here with us. And uh, I want to share some few, a few of announcements uh, with you. And they are on the screen our offerings today go to our Pacific Union. What that means is, for those of you who are not familiar with how the Adventist Church is structured, um, on a more local, regional basis, the Pacific Union comprises all churches in Hawaii, California, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. And they have their projects, they spread the monies out for certain projects, and so that's where the offerings will automatically go, unless, of course, for those of you who are giving our, your offerings online or if you're going to mail them in, if you want your offerings to remain for the local church budget here in Tempe, then you have to place your envelopes either online. You have to indicate that to make sure they go to our local church budget. If you're mailing it in, fill out a tithe envelope. If you have them at home, make sure it says local church budget and uh, etc. Now, here's a way to give your offerings. We are still doing our church drive through which is today from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Our head deacon will be here to collect those offerings. All you do is drive through, drop off your offerings uh, and tithes in a basket. You don't have to get out of your car. It'll, it'll be uh, door height, the basket, and you just drop them off. Or you can give online at tempeadventist.com. And um, on the top of the homepage, it says online giving. Just click on there. And in fact, it looks like a... Um, a tithe envelope, and you can just fill in the, the spaces, or you can mail it in in our church address, Tempe Seventh Adventist Church, 41 East 13th Street, Tempe, Arizona. If you're going to mail them in, I suggest you take a picture of this before I go to the next slide. <laughs> or just go to tempeadventist.com and you'll see our address there. So, those are three ways that uh, you can give. And also, uh, if you're, if you're, well, this is our last Sabbath that we're doing our live stream. Uh, so one individual has been bringing their offerings and leaving them here on the pew, so so that's good. We are still doing the live stream, so I'm going to talk about that. We're still doing the live stream. I want to uh, say a happy May birthday to Jordan Garnick. If Garnicks, if you are watching, Jordan, happy birthday. Don't know how old you are today, or not today on the 27th. Uh, that's only four days. What would that be? Wednesday, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday. So Wednesday is Jordan's birthday. And then Daniel Lewis, our head deacon, is also celebrating his birthday. And he'll be here in a little bit. So happy birthday to both of you, Jordan and Daniel. And then our Sabbath school Friday night Zoom is discontinued. Um, for a number of weeks, I've been uh, teaching the Sabbath school quarterly uh, via Zoom on Friday nights. That is discontinued now, and I'm going to explain why, because there is a new Zoom Sabbath school class, and that begins next Sabbath, 9.45 in the morning. Chris, I want you to come on up here. I'm going to show you the teacher. I'll just kind of go over here. So this is Chris, and he is going to be teaching that class, and again, it starts next Sabbath at 9.45 in the morning, and you're using right. the regular quarterly regular lesson. lesson. Uh, we'll be doing the regular lesson, but this is just for those that don't feel 100% comfortable with coming to church yet. If you want to wait a little bit, you can still enjoy Sabbath school with us via the Zoom. Yes. So, yeah, great. So thank you, Chris. Um, and, of course, church attendance during this pandemic when we're reopening, um, it's obviously voluntary. We're not, we're not, it's always voluntary, pandemic or not. <laughs> So we're not forcing you to come back and say you must come back because we're having our sort of grand reopening. Um, but thank you, Chris, for teaching that class. So next Sabbath, 9.45 in the morning, if you're staying home, um, that ID number is what you need. And um, our church reopening, I mentioned, is May 30. We are going to have some changes that are taking place um, as uh, precautionary measures 
uh, because of the virus. Our seating arrangements are going to change, children's classes, masks, uh, offerings, etc. So here's where I actually want to go to our church website. So I'm going to do a switch here. And okay, so here's our church website. Now, if you go to tempeadventist.com, I want to show you right up here is where you can give online. If you're looking at the screen, um, you just click on that. And here's where I said it looks like a tithe envelope. And there it is. So you can just fill in those spaces there. And it's even in Spanish. And I don't know what that language is. Is that <laughs> tithe, diezmo, dime, deem, dime? I don't know what language that is. But anyway, so that's where you can give online. Um, go to the home page. Now, if you scroll down, here's where you click to see our live service, which you're doing right now. And it says here, Tempe Church will reopen for in-person church services. That's next Saturday. And then if you scroll here, it says here is a PDF that you can read or that you can download. And that is our guidelines and safety protocols for in-church services. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about this. I'm just going to click on that. Okay. And here is that uh, document, uh, May 30. And this is the seating arrangement. In fact, I want to thank Jacqueline, who was leading out the songs this morning. She came up with this diagram um, that where you see this red, uh, these red lines. These gray areas are the pews. These red lines are going to be taped off. In other words, the red is off limits. And so people are going to sit here and here and here and there in a checkerboard fashion. Families obviously uh, will stay together. We don't need to separate them. And I don't know if you want to say anything else about that. So that is our seating arrangements. And I want to say all of this is indefinitely. I'm not going to say it's going to last till the end of the year or into next year or till October. We just don't know. But for now, this, these are indefinite um, uh, practices we're going to do. Our greeters and bulletins. Um, there will be a greeter, but they will not hand you the bulletin nor shake your hand. The bulletins will be placed on a little table that you can just grab yourself. Um, we will be our janitors, uh, the Solis family. They'll be wiping things down, et cetera, and sanitizing. Even during the worship service and Sabbath school, uh, uh, bathrooms, et cetera, will be wiped down a couple of times. Um, there will be no potlucks, et cetera. Masks, if you do have a mask, we do invite you to wear your mask. Um, those of, uh, there's, there's all kinds of opinions across the board. Mask, I don't need a mask. Yes, I want to wear a mask. Uh, again, we're not forcing uh, uh, anybody except seating arrangements. We are going to enforce that. But if you have a mask, wear it. <clears throat> if not, I think we'll have about 15 masks uh, that will be available here that you can have thanks to uh, my dear wife and her, her generosity. And uh, if you are sick or ill, stay home. Our water fountain outside will be shut off. And our hymnals, we're going to invite you not to use the hymnals. We're going to be singing um, and watching the words on the screen, the lyrics on the screen. Now, here are the Sabbath services where um, there are some changes. The beginner's class, if you look right here where I'm circling, um, the beginner's class is taught by Jacqueline, who just let out in our songs. If you go to Facebook and type in the search box, A Heavenly Home, at 1015, every Sabbath morning at 1015 in the morning, Facebook, A Heavenly Home, uh, Jacqueline is teaching her class online. So there, there will be no in-person classes for the beginner's class. For the kindergarten class right here, um, that class um, has, will not be meeting in person until further notice. The primary junior class we will meet. Um, uh, Todd Beeson is the teacher. We'll meet in the primary room. The early teen slash teen class will meet in the assembly room. That is taught by J Jason R. As far as the adult classes, right in here in the sanctuary, we're only going to have one major uh, general adult class. And then, of course, um, you saw Chris just a moment ago. He's going to be teaching this new Zoom class. If you're not comfortable with attending church yet, every Sabbath at 9.45 in the morning, go to Zoom. And again, um, there's the information on this document. And I will teach my class. We do a different, completely different lesson for the pastor's class. And I'm going to be meeting at our customary place in the, in the, uh, in the West Wing. Our worship service is going to look a little bit different. 
Um, we're going to just welcome you here from the front. There, we won't have the meet and greet time and all that physical contact as we usually do, which I, I'm going to miss because <laughs> we all shake hands and we all hug. And that's one of the things that is, is just unfortunate we're going to miss. Uh, I, I already mentioned uh, the seating. We will still have the children's story. I talked to our children's story director this week, and we will still have the story. Did I say that right? We will still. That was almost a, a tongue twister. But we will not be inviting the children to come forward. They will be remaining in their seats. Our offerings will change. You had a question? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I think I have that uh, coming up. Um, so our offerings are going to look different as well. The deacons will not be uh, uh, going through, and, or you will not actually be passing on the offering plate. All offerings, whether it's lamb's offering, Sabbath school offerings, our church offerings, and tithes, they, you will drop those off at the end of the worship service at an offering plate at the exit. That's how we will be collecting those. And again, I want to remind all of us for Sabbath school offerings, um, we're going to have to conscientiously remember to put those in a tithe envelope and mark Sabbath school offerings. The same with the Lamb's offering, which goes to our children's ministries. And then, Chris, thank you. Um, can you see me over here? On these two wings here, the west wing and the east wing, these wings are going to be reserved for our elderly, um, for those who feel comfortable coming back to church. So uh, please, if you're not a senior citizen, um, you need to be seated in the regular pews and leave the side wings, what we call the east and the west wing, um, for the elders, for the elderly, the senior citizens. Okay, um, and then, so again, go to this document, go to our church website, uh, click on our guidelines and safety protocols, and you can read all of these things for yourself, okay? All right, so... We hope that you can join us next Sabbath. We are going to continue live streaming. Again, for those um, who don't feel comfortable coming back, we are going to continue what we're doing right now. The only thing I would say is if you are able to come, if you're not sick, if you feel comfortable coming back, um, don't use the live stream as, well, I don't want to get up in the morning and make that drive because I know that we can all be tempted to, you know what, I'm so used to this. I, I just get my laptop and I can lay down in bed and listen to the sermon <laughs> or the Sabbath school class. I don't want you to make this as a crutch um, when, if you feel comfortable coming and, and if you're able, physically able, and if you're not ill in any fashion, um, it does take effort to get your kids up in the morning and get dressed, and, but that's, isn't God worth it? God is, is worth it. So don't use it as an excuse to just stay in bed and relax at home. Uh, we want you to come um, again if you are comfortable and able to come. All right. I want to invite, uh, we have a special treat this morning because we have... Um, Let's see, I want to make sure I got my order right. We have Tom with us, and Tom is going to have our opening prayer uh, this morning. And then after that, Chris will follow with the scripture reading. A happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, what a wonderful day this is. That God has Amen. given us the Sabbath for a purpose, and that is to give a, a reprieve and to allow us to take all the burdens everything that's going on in this world and place it at the foot of the cross. Yes, amen. And let us do that in prayer. Amen. Grant us that even though we're in different locations, it doesn't matter because God knows the heart. He sees us and collectively he hears our prayers. Yes. God tells us before they speak, I will answer. <clears throat> And while they are talking, I will hear them. Amen. And so, if you would please, at this time, bow your heads with me as we come to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we give you praise for the Sabbath day. Amen. Everything could be falling apart in this world, but you told us, Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. And you told us too, Lord, 
that in this world you have tribulation. But you said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And Lord, replace all of our burdens, all of our anxieties, everything, Lord, that just kind of drags us down and steals that joy that you so abundantly want to have us filled with. And we place it for the cross. And we ask at this point, Lord, you know our heart. You know what's on our minds. You know what we said and done and thought. And we just come to you in honesty and ask that you would forgive us for wounding you, for not giving you all of us. And we ask, Lord, that you would grant us your Holy Spirit to fall upon us, to dwell in us. Lord, to create in us a new heart that we may be living epistles, that we can bring joy to someone who doesn't know you. And they can see us, but they really are seeing you. And we ask too, for your blessings and your wisdom and the words through the Holy Spirit that you would fill Pastor Ray as he gives the word, the manna from heaven. We so desperately need every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And this morning, during this message, it's going to touch us. And we thank you and praise you. And Lord, Grant us wisdom and allow us to do according to your will as we proceed and step out in faith to convocate according to your ways. Lord, you have led the church and you have never abandoned it. And we stand on your truce. And we know, Lord, that you are coming soon. Yes. And we just ask that you would just allow us to thank you and we thank you for Calvary, that the blood that was shed has cleansed us and that it's through you that we can shine the light of love and mercy of our Lord Jesus to this world and you will come and take us home. We ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. So I invite you to read along with me on the screen as we read this passage. Uh, It says, and this is God speaking, he says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Amen. 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 (laughs) Yes. Thank you, Chris. And uh, I want to say that Tom is uh, Jacqueline's uh, dad, so we're glad that uh, you both are here this morning. That was great. Thank you so much. And uh, all right, I want to share the uh, praises and requests uh, with you all um, as we continue. And uh, again, obviously no particular order of importance. It's just I read them, I read them off according to when I get them. And uh, so they're coming in. So this comes from the Guzman family. Happy Sabbath. Blessings and peace to all our church family. So the Guzmans say hi. And uh, they're asking for, for prayers for themselves, Joey, Lydia, and Araceli. And so we're glad that you're joining us again. And hello back. Uh, this uh, comes from Shirley Beeson. She's praising God for giving us another day of life and to be able to enjoy his nature that's great. I wonder if they're probably, are you going hiking this afternoon or someplace? <laughs> or are you in nature right now? But uh, anyways, uh, thank you, Shirley. This comes from uh, Raul Vasquez. Um, he is giving thanks and praise to God for his son that he was finally able to talk to after months of nothing. He asked prayers for him 
and he is in a challenging relationship. And so, Raul, we praise the Lord along with you, and, and we're happy for you that you were able to communicate with your son. Um, and this one is from Lydia. This is Joe Guzman's family, uh, wife, uh, to pray for Joey. And good morning, Pastor. Please pray for Joey Guzman. Multiple myeloma cancer is back. Uh, found lesions on, on, on the rins and spine. Pray for healing as for his, and for his pain. So this is coming from your wife, uh, Joey, Lydia, and also from your daughter, Araceli. And, and so we want to pray for, for Joey. We're going to pray for you, Joey. And thank you for that. This comes from my mom, who's watching from Victorville, California. She's praying for members who have stayed away to come back and revive the church again. <laughs> so thank you, Mom. And we're praying for that too. Um, again, if everybody is, is feeling comfortable. And this comes from my son, Ray. Um, Stephanie's friend, Maria, is in the hospital because of complications with her pregnancy. She's considered high risk. So please, let's pray for Maria, uh, who is in the hospital. And we pray that you know, the Lord will just touch her, and you know how, how special it is to want to have a baby. And so we want everything to turn out uh, well for Maria. Um, this is coming from my sister Diana. She's viewing from Los Angeles. She says, Happy Sabbath. Uh, she's thankful that she's here. She's at home with my mom. They live separate, of course. And so my sister is visiting uh, my mom for the weekend. Uh, for it's isn't it Memorial Weekend this weekend for Memorial Weekend? Um, my sister wants us to pray for Danny. That is her son to pray for his health And my sister would like for us to pray for the Pico Rivera bilingual SDA church I've been there before in fact, I've preached there before and that's in uh, in the LA basin and so to pray for her local church and let's see, boy, we have fewer requests and in, in, in praises than than we usually have. That was it. Okay, so um, I want to invite you to remember all of these uh, prayer requests and of course these praises and gratitudes that encourage us and strengthen us and remind us that, hey, I could be thankful for this and that. So that's why it's important to share um, the reasons why you're grateful. So i like us for us to pray at this time, and then right after this prayer, we are going to go straight into our message. I would invite you to uh, kneel with me, if you would, at home, if you can, and let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for the, these many reasons that our brothers and sisters have expressed um, family communication between father and son. Um, we thank you, God, that good, uh, for good health. We thank you, Lord, for um, our families being together, like my mom and my sister being together. We thank you, God, for life itself, for nature, as Shirley mentioned. And uh, we thank you, God, for um, all of the blessings um, and the needs that you supply for us, Lord. We thank you for that. We most of all thank you, as, was, as Tom mentioned, for Calvary and Jesus going, deciding to go to the cross and sacrifice uh, yourself in love and for our salvation and our forgiveness. We thank you for that, Lord. And um, Lord, we know that you are a forgiving God, and we come to you confessing our sins, Lord, um, as individuals, as a church, Lord. We know our calling. We know our mission. We know our commission that you have given to us, Lord, in Matthew 28. And Lord, we need reminding of our calling to be close to you, and to, to do your work, Lord, and to live the life that you live, Jesus. We need that reminder. And Lord, we uh, sometimes fall into temptations. Our arch enemy, Satan, is out there wanting to destroy us and to erase your image and your will in us. So we ask for your forgiveness, Jesus, and we thank you for your graciousness and your mercy. Lord, we bring these requests to you this morning. We know, Lord, you have told us to make our requests uh, known to you, not in order to inform you, but that we can be powerful in prayer and open to you, Lord. So we, we bring these requests to you. We pray for Maria, Lord, that her pregnancy, please, Jesus, we pray that her pregnancy will, will be well 
um, that you will guard the health of the little baby and Maria. Um, so, Lord, we pray that you will be in that situation. Lord, we pray for my own nephew, Danny, for his health and that you will uh, heal him, Lord Jesus. We want to pray for all of our brothers and sisters in other churches, the Pico Rivera Bilingual Church, Lord. We pray for our brethren over there and all of our sister churches around the globe. Lord, we pray for um, our government leaders uh, federally and locally, that you will guide them, that your Holy Spirit will work on their consciences, and Lord, that you will help us, as I had preached last week, help us to be upright citizens, help us to uh, respect and obey the laws, um, and Lord, help us to be strong and courageous when we know that your laws take precedence. Um, Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for the direction that this country is going in. We pray for other countries around the world, Lord Jesus. We know that you are a God in control of the affairs of this world. We know, Lord, from the book of Daniel, that nothing is surprising to you, that you have ordained and ordered um, the movements of mankind and you are guiding, and so help us to trust you always. Lord, we pray that you will bless our service the portion that remains, specifically, Lord, my preaching, I pray that your word will be preached by me with clarity, with all of the force of it. And Lord, I pray that everyone will be blessed with this message. I'm imperfect, Lord, and so use me for your honor and glory. And, and thank you, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath morning. And Lord, next week when we open up our church once again, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, keep us blessed, keep us safe, and that our brothers and sisters will come together once again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Exodus. Uh, Chris, would you be so kind as to hand me my Bible there? Thank you so much. So open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, and I'll be getting that uh, to um, some passages in just a minute. I have a question for those of you who are here and those of you who are uh, out there. How many of you have treasures? How many of you have treasures? Well, maybe you never considered something you really like or are attached to as a treasure, but indeed it is. So how many of us have treasures? I can't hear you. Can you speak louder? <laughs> Chris has a treasure. What's your treasure, Chris? I think it's from thinking of the valuable things that I own just in terms of computer, trumpets, right. phone. Okay. Thing. The valuable things Chris says that he owns, like uh, he's, a tr he's a trumpet player, his car, uh, computer, uh, so we all have we all have treasures, and uh, I know that you can think of some of your treasures. Some of them have uh, monetary value, others sentimental value, and and are both combined. Well, I actually brought a bag of treasures with me here today, and so I want to show you um, some of the treasures that I have here. Now, um, as a boy. One of my treasures, oh, I don't know, I was probably about uh, seven years old, six years old, eight years old. Um, one of my treasures as a boy was marbles. We used to play marbles in the dirt. Any of you guys ever play marbles? Anybody put marbles here? I remember I had those what we called cat eye marbles and the big ones that had like little sparkles in it. That was one of my treasures. And then... Um, when I was a little older, I guess about the same age, the treasures that I had as a little boy were Hot Wheels, these little cars, Hot Wheel cars and Matchbox cars. And then uh, one Christmas I got a, I'm glad John is here because one Christmas I received the gift from my mom who was watching a Johnny Lightning racing track. And some years ago, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, it was quite a while back, I was preaching about, um, about that, that my mom got me this uh, Johnny Lightning uh, racetrack for Christmas and how I just loved it so much. 
And then um, I believe it was on my desk, and I have it right here. So um, a little while after that, I told you I had some treasures with me. Uh, I, I think a, a week or two or maybe three weeks later, John Baker, who was sitting here, he brought me a gift. He listened to that Johnny Lightning <laughs> illustration, and he brought me a gift, and he actually got me a Johnny Lightning race car. And I was just, I put it in this bag here, and I didn't open it, of course, um, but he got me, it's still in the original packaging, uh, Johnny Lightning, Jet Power, nothing like it in the world. And I was just so touched, and, and I still have it, John. <laughs> I was just so touched uh, that John got me this, this, this race car. And uh, it, was just, it was just amazing, it was an amazing gift. So thanks again, John. But as I got older, <clears throat> my uh, treasures changed, and so, um, I'm going to bring out a couple of other treasures that I have here, and that is, let's see, let me get to this. As I got older, namely in high school, uh, some of my treasures changed, and when I was in, in football in high school, we would have the uh, pep rally on, on uh, Friday mornings at school. The football players, we would wear our jerseys to school and then during recess, about 15 minutes, the cheerleaders would be out there in the band and, and uh, you know, and all of the, the cheerleaders and the drill team girls would come and they would pin things on all of the football players. Uh, there were certain drill team girls that were assigned to a football player. One year, I think I had three or four drill team girls and they would come and pin these things. And, and, I, and I kept a lot of these things. And this one, uh, my number was 68. It says here, this is a treasure for me. Player of the week, Ray Navarro. And so the previous game, I was the player of the week. And then here's another one, the player of the week. <laughs> so I really, I treasured these things. And when my dad, um, who is now resting in the Lord, um, my dad actually filmed all of our football games. This one here is dated October 27, 1978. And this is a this is a super eight uh, super eight millimeter of color sound, and I have all of my original football games uh, on these reels that my dad had taped uh, way back then. So these are these are treasures. These are really really treasures for me. And then um, as I got older, of course, uh, you know your treasure starts to change, and you start looking at girls. And so I remember my first girlfriend. That was my treasure. I want to show you a treasure that my son had when he was a little boy, and that is this. He really, really treasured these things. Now, there's about, I don't know, maybe six of these albums that we have. This is um, The Bible in Living Sound, 60 Stories on 10 Tapes. And if you open these, they're cassette tapes, and they're dramatized Bible stories. Now, Chris, it's probably been a while since you've seen a cassette tape, right? <laughs> or anybody. But uh, these are in mint condition. I mean, just mint condition. And my son would listen to these. And uh, we had a little cassette player. And I would tell him stories sometimes. And, and when he got older, he would just listen to these. This was, this was his treasure. And then, of course, <clears throat> talking about my son... I want to share another treasure with you. And um, I had fun going through the boxes. This is my little son's first little shoes. <laughs> and my, my wife has saved a lot of things uh, when my son was little, and, and this, is, this is one of them. And I have something else, which is my wife's treasure. I'm just going to pull it out here. And this is Swiss chard. We have a really awesome kind of wilting because I, I picked it, but um, you know, Swiss chard, you ever eaten Swiss chard in food? Mm. Very good, very good. <laughs> My wife loves greens. We have an amazing garden at home, and I could say that the, uh, our garden is my wife's treasure. Um, she takes care of it, waters it. Um, it's amazing to eat organic things. I love it, I just absolutely love it. I treasured my little boy when, I still do, but when he was small, we would play Legos together. We would spend time together. We'd play football in the living room together. Um, there was just those times that I treasured with my, my boy when he was growing up. I have one more treasure to share with you. This one I bought in 2017, and uh, 
I have various Bibles at home. This one is the one that I treasure the most because, I don't know if you can zoom in, but uh, every page, every other page in this Bible is blank so that you can write your notes. So here's a text. There's a blank page. Uh, here comes Proverbs. There's the text. There's a blank page. Every one. I bought this when I was in the book of John. So if I can, I'll just show you. Here's my notes. See how I write notes in there? I journal. In fact, I even I did a map there and I put little sticky notes. Every other page, I can put my notes. And this is a Bible that I truly, truly treasure. So I know that you have your treasures at home. When we think about treasures, we take care of them, don't we? I know, Chris, you take care of your trumpet, you take care of your computer. You don't just toss it carelessly aside. We take care of our treasures. If it's an object, we set them apart. Uh, we put, put them on the shelf in a separate place. We take special care of them, um, maybe at a deposit box at the bank, or maybe in a safe. Some of our most treasured uh, items we may keep in a safe. Now, let me ask you a question. Do our treasure, treasures change as we get older? Do our treasures change as we get older? And I would ask you why, if the answer is yes, why do they change when we get older? I would say it's because what we value, um, our perspectives, they change as we get older. Um, let me ask you this. Can a person treasure the wrong things? Can a person treasure the wrong things? I'm thinking of addictions. Some people, unfortunately, are addicted to something uh, or maybe even someone. Uh, addictions can be uh, a negative treasure. How about competition or power? If we treasure power and some people will do anything to gain power and influence, um, or how about appearance or attention? Some people really, really treasure their appearance. Um, about a book years ago, and um, this is a true story. Anne was a real teenager some time ago, and uh, she was interviewed by Ariel Levy, an author, and this is what Anne said as a teenager. I remember one time I was at John's house with him and David, and I was looking at the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. I got in a really, really terrible mood, and I wouldn't talk because I thought Heidi Klum was just so pretty, and I was like mad. I get really upset when guys find girls really attractive because I want that attention. Unfortunately, I think that is the same story that could be repeated in thousands and thousands of young teenagers, guys or, 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 or girls. How can you find what you treasure? How can you find what you treasure? Well, I would say the time that you spend nurturing or giving attention to something, that could be your treasure. The energy and time you spent thinking about something um, or nurturing that, that is a good indicator that that's probably what your treasure is. The other thing I wanna say is that uh, the things that you take care of or that you store for example, um, a way that you can find your treasure is simply just look in the garage and look in the closet. Go to your garage, go to your closet, and look at the things that you have been saving and those times where it's time to clean up and you open those lids, uh, I, I wanna keep this, and you save it year after year after year. That's a good indicator of what you save, what you keep under a cover is probably your treasure, and in fact, when I was grabbing some of these items uh, this morning in my garage, it is so easy to start reminiscing when you look at those old items. When I looked at my box full of high school stuff, I saw my uh, um, yearbooks there and other things, oh, and I just started thinking back. Um, but that's a good indicator of what your treasure is. Your time spent nurturing or giving attention to and the things that you take care of or that you store. But let me say this about treasures, and I don't want to get into the message. Treasures can collect dust. Treasures can collect dust. Now, even though they're valued, whether they have sentimental value to them or whether they have monetary value, the fact of the matter is many of our treasures 
can collect dust. And I don't mean, like I said, they're in, in protective plastic or in a, a plastic storage bin, etc. What I mean by collecting dust is that they're just there someplace and they're in storage, but they're not in use. Some of our treasures we don't use simply because of the fact that we may want this treasure to last. <clears throat> don't think that I uh, take some of this stuff out that I just showed you. They've been in, under inside a box for years. So some treasures that we treasure may not even be in use when we're talking about objects. <clears throat> so you have your Bibles open to the book of Exodus. Um, I want to invite you to, re, uh, to go with me to Exodus chapter 19. <clears throat> Because this morning I want to talk about, and my sermon title is called, God's Treasure. God's Treasure. So look at Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to look at verse 1. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. God's Treasure. The Bible says, in the third month, after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, where Mount Horeb was, or Mount Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped to the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. So in the third month um, after the Israelites uh, left Egypt, that life of slavery and just uh, horrible suffering and agony, um, they were happy to be free. And in the third month, they arrived there at Mount Sinai. And then in verse 3, the Bible says that Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. So Moses goes up to the mountain, God talks to him, and God gives Moses a message for all the people. Now, the people that were encamped at the, at the foot of the mountain at Mount Sinai, there must have been over a million because the Bible numbers uh, roughly 600, a little over 600,000 men that were counted, not counting the women and, and children. So um, most scholars believe there was, there was over a million, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 million, who knows? But there were a lot of people there. And so God now gives Moses a message, message to tell all of these people, hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of people, that this message is for. And what does God say? Look at verse 4. <clears throat> you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. God is saying, remember, you yourselves witnessed how I saved you in miraculous ways, from the, uh, from the Egyptian uh, slaveholders. Verse 5, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. Some versions say you will be, instead of my own possession, my special treasure. My special treasure. God's treasure. And in verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Let me grab my water here really quick. <coughs> so this, this is God's message to all the people. He's telling the people through Moses what God did to the Egyptians. He's asking them to remember, go back just a, a few months earlier. Remember what I did to them. So he's telling them, remember. Then he says, how I bore, you on the, uh, the, I bore all of you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. And then God, so what God is doing, first of all, is that he's sharing with them a message in those couple of verses, a message of salvation, a message of judgment. He saved them from the Egyptians, but at the same time that he was saving he was also casting judgment upon the Egyptians for what they were doing to the Israelites and also a judgment upon the Egyptians' gods. So it's salvation slash judgment. This is what God is saying. And then God is making a request to the people through Moses. He is making a request. He is saying to obey my voice. 
Obey my voice, God says. Listen to what I have to say. Kind of like Proverbs, the first four chapters, where um, wisdom is personified and wisdom speaks. Listen, listen to me, listen to me. God is saying, obey my voice. And then he says, keep my covenant. This is what he says in verse 5. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant. Now these two things, God is reminding the people, this is how I saved you. This is what I did to the Egyptians. Now, because I did that, I'm asking you to do these things. Obey me and keep my covenant. And if you do that, then God says, this is the result. This is the result of God's request. He says, you will be my own possession or my special treasure among all the peoples for the earth is mine. You will be my special treasure. I want to invite you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. If you have your Bibles there at home, Deuteronomy and here live. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. And this is what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his what? Special treasure or his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now the Hebrew word for treasure, uh, possession is segula. And it's used to describe Israel as God's treasured possession eight times in the Old Testament, eight times. This term and its cognates designate someone as a special personal possession of his God. A special personal possession of his God. That's what that word means. Um, in the Bible, its meaning shades over into beloved and singles out Israel before Yahweh. So God's special, his own possession, his special treasure, it's a something special that belongs to God. Now, this belongs to us. This is something special. These are my, my son's feet are now this big. <laughs> and this is my son's size of his feet before. This is a, this is a special possession that we have, which is why, which is why uh, we keep it uh, preserved. That's, by the way, that's 30 years old. My son is 30 years old. Um, but um, in Deuteronomy, excuse me, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7 and chapter 14 and in later Jewish tradition, they converted this term, this treasure or possession, they converted that term from a promise to a, listen to this, a responsibility requiring the entire Jewish people, not just the priests, to live a code by a code of holiness, God's commandments, and to serve as priests, bringing knowledge of God to the world. And this is what we're going to go over in those next two verses. And by the way, um, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is, that's where what? Your heart is also. This is what Jesus said many, many centuries later. Wherever your treasure is, that is where your heart is going to be. Much like our garden at home or my Bible that I, I treasure and I keep in that, in that slide box. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is going to be. That's why I said earlier, how can you figure out what your treasure is? It's what you spend a lot of time thinking about. Or it's what you spend a lot of time nurturing. Or, or something that you especially care for and keep under guard. Those are good indicators of what your treasure is. Because that's where your heart is. This is exactly what Jesus is saying. So I want to say to you this morning, God's treasure. What is God's treasure? What is his possession? It's you. It's me. God's treasure is not something to keep in a box, under a lid, in the safe, something that is immovable, something that is inanimate. God's treasure is organic, alive, a creation, a living and breathing being. And the Bible says what God is telling Moses to tell these hundreds of thousands of people, Moses is telling them, you, are God's special treasure. People are God's special treasure, are God's own special possession. 
And here's the interesting thing that God says about his special treasure. Verse 6, we're back to Exodus chapter 19. <clears throat> and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what he says to his special treasure. You will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Moses comes down. He repeats these words to the Israelites in verses 7 and 8. And then the people respond in verse 8. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. I have a question about this. I wonder if the people, when they said to Moses, Everything that the Lord says we will do, I wonder if they actually knew the stipulations to this covenant, because God uses the word covenant. Did they know all of the stipulations? Because before Exodus 19, nothing is recorded of the terms of the covenant. Absolutely zero. You have the Israelites coming out. Uh, they get to the mount. Um, you have the falling of the manna in Exodus chapter 16. But you don't have any specifics and details of the covenant. And yet the people say that they'll do everything that they do. They were willing to obey God um, even before they heard all of the details. In fact, I want to read 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 because Peter actually repeats, um, repeats this concept of what we're talking about here in Exodus chapter 19. This is what the Apostle Peter says in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Into His marvelous light. This is what Peter repeats. It's the same thing that God is telling Moses in the Old Testament. You will be a covenant people to me. You will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Peter says that, and he says, so that you can proclaim the goodness of the Lord who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I have a couple of questions regarding this text. And you might be thinking to yourselves the same thing in the form of questions. What did God mean when he said, a kingdom of priests. What did he mean back in Exodus 19, Exodus 19, a kingdom of priests? I ask that question because the priesthood in all of its categories and duties and in its, in, in its whole description as a ministry, it hasn't come about yet. We, ha we don't see that before Exodus 19. So what did God mean when he said a kingdom of priests. Well, let me share with you um, what priest meant for the Israelites. If you look at the word priest in the Old Testament before Exodus 19, you'll find in Genesis chapter 14, you'll find a priest of the Most High God. His name was Melchizedek. The book of Hebrews repeats this and says that Jesus was a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is only mentioned there in Genesis um, in relationship with Abraham, and it's a, he's a very, honestly, a very mysterious figure. Not much is known at all about Melchizedek, except that he was the king of Salem, Jerusalem, uh, Salem, and he was a priest of the Most High God. So um, undoubtedly, the Jews, um, unless their sojourn in Egypt and their slavery just wiped the, you know, the memory of Melchizedek out of their minds, but you read about Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, but there's no more detail than that. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 45, Joseph, who ended up saving Egypt, he became the prince of Egypt, Egypt, he actually married the daughter of a priest of Egypt. This priest's name was Potiphar. He was the priest of On, and Joseph married his daughter um, while he was in Egypt. And then, of course, in Genesis chapter seven, uh, 47, verses 22, you, re you read about the priests of Egypt. Uh, their land was not sold. Um, during the famine, uh, 
uh, uh, during the seven years of plenty and then the seven years of famine that followed, well, during that seven years of famine, this is during the time of Joseph, a lot of the Egyptians ended up selling their land to the Pharaoh, um, except for the priests of Egypt. Um, that's what that reference is to. And then, of course, um, um, uh, Raul, Ruel, um, otherwise known as Jethro, he goes by those two names, Ruel and Jethro. He was the priest of Midian, and Moses ended up marrying his daughter Zipporah. So he was a priest of Midian. But again, there's no description of what the priestly duties were. So in general, let me say this, and I'm going to bring this home to apply to us as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So bear with me as I, as I share this with you because then I'm going to apply it to us uh, in, their, in their day in Exodus chapter 19 and in our day. Uh, priestly duties and activities, they, they varied somewhat, but primary in the early period and always basic, always basic, was the idea that a priest is a person attached to the service of God in a sanctuary. If it were false gods or if it were other gods, it was attached somehow serving God in a holy place in God's house. The original concept of the priest was as a server or a minister of God in the sanctuary, and that was analogous to that of a king's minister in the palace. So, for example, as ministers in the palace set food on the table before uh, an earthly king, early Israelite priests set holy bread on the table before God. So there's, that's what they would do. They would serve before God in his house. Um, and this was a practice that underlay the provisions for the bread of the presence, once the Israelites built their sanctuary and there was a table of the presence or showbread. Um, and then also as ministers of a king, anybody who was in the palace ministering to the king, they served as intermediaries for citizens wishing to ask the king what course of action to take, what course of action to take or what the king's mind might be in a certain matter. So king, what are you thinking? I need to share this with the people. And so that's what a minister in the palace would do. Um, and then they would share that with the people. Early Israelite priests asked God the same sort of questions. You've heard about this Urim and the Thummim uh, on the priest's ephod. Then they, the priest would be a mediator between the people and God and ask God uh, same sorts of questions. Um, and it was so he was an intermediary between God in his holy place and the people outside that a priest would communicate blessings to. In fact, here in the Tempe Church, we used to sing a song every Sabbath. After the worship service, we would hold hands. And what would, what would be that song that we would sing? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Well, that was a blessing that the priests would pronounce upon the people, a blessing from God upon the people. So this is what a priest would do. A priest would... Uh, generally minister to God in his house, but a priest would also minister to God in other ways as far as being an intermediary between the people and between God. So serving God close to him in sacrosanct, educating the people about what's on God's mind as a minister would educate the people, what was on the king's mind in the palace. That's what priests' general duties were. So let me bring this home. This is what God is saying to the people as they are on their way to make their new homes in Canaan. He is saying, I saved you. I rescued you. Now, because I did all of this for you, I'm going to make a request. I want you to obey my voice. I want you to listen to me. I want you to serve me. He says, because I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. What that means in their context. And what it means for us today, and this is what Peter said in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. You are God's special possession. We are God's special possession. We are his treasure. We belong to God. Therefore, you and I, we are priests. We serve God in his presence. We come to God asking what his will is. And what we do as God's people as we serve the people on planet Earth as mediators 
as intermediaries, educating and helping and guiding people in this world to know what's on God's mind. To know what's on God's mind. This is what God is asking and commanding the people to do. When you go into Canaan, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to let all the Canaanites know about me. You're going to educate them. You're going to show them by decree and by life, witness, and character what's on my mind, what I'm all about. Because all they do is worship these other gods and they sacrifice their children to these gods and there's a lot of um, uh, corrupt sexuality involved in worship of their other gods, etc. I want you to be my priest. You are going to show them what I'm all about. And isn't that true today? Isn't that true today? That's why Peter repeats this concept way in, way of, in the future in the New Testament. We are to be priests in this world. You are a priest of God if you belong to God, if you have connected to God and you have said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. You are a priest in this planet. I am a priest in this planet. This is what the priestly duties were. But also what the Bible says there in verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is what God's special treasure is. These people that he calls his own possession, his special treasure, they're not only priests revealing God's character to the world and what, what is on God's mind, what his will is for people. But the Bible also says that his possession, his treasure, is to be a holy nation. Now we've heard of um, statements in the Bible, both in Old and New Testament, such as, be holy because what? I am holy. This is what God says. You be holy because I am holy. It's like, it's like all of us telling our children, children, I want you to be honest because I'm honest. Children, I want you to be truthful and respect people because I'm truthful and respect people. Now, <clears throat> our children are not going to do that if they see the opposite in us, right? <clears throat> we can say certain things and actually demonstrate something completely else by our actions. So we need to be careful on that. But God is saying, I am your father. You're my possession. You're my kids. You're my children. I'm holy. It would only make sense that God would require of us to be holy too. Can you imagine God saying, I am holy. I'm perfect. Um, I'm compassionate. I'm loving. I'm truthful, uh, etc., etc. But if you want to lie sometimes, if you want to cheat sometimes, if you want to be unfaithful sometimes, if you want to be angry and vengeful and vindictive and bitter sometimes, um, if you don't want to tell the truth but you want to gossip sometimes, I understand what life is like on planet Earth. It's not perfect. Uh, my son was there, so I get it. Um, if you don't want to be completely honest and truthful and holy, and you want to kind of ride the fence sometimes, and in fact, even jump on the other side of the fence and see what it's like to live a worldly lifestyle. I understand. That's okay. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll let you do that sometimes. Just don't go overboard, but I'll let you do that. So, can you imagine God talking like that? Of course not. God says, I'm holy. I want you to be the same as my special treasure, as my special possession. I want you to reflect what I am like and what I'm about. Deuteronomy chapter 26, <clears throat> I, want you to invite you, uh, I want to invite you to open your Bibles there. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Okay, it's like three books after Exodus. So you go forward, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So three books after Exodus to your right. Exodus chapter 26, and I want to start reading verse 16. Verse 16. And the Bible says this, This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and ordinances. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. In fact, I believe it was Isaiah that said, 
um, God was saying to his people, this is many, many centuries later, God was saying through the prophet Isaiah, you people only worship me through rote. And I think that's the problem with a lot of our worship and obedience and followership of God today. We're just going through the motions. It's just through rote. What God is saying here in verse 16, with all your heart and with all your soul, it's got to be right here. It's got to be with the heart. Not just by rote, not just by memory, not just going through the motions because everybody else does it this way and so I do it. No, it's got to be with the heart. Verse 17, you have today declared the Lord to be your God and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes. He's saying, you decided to walk with God. You decided to keep his, his, his statutes, his commandments, and his ordinances, and listen to his voice. The Lord has today declared you to be his people, a treasured possession, as he promised you, and that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you high. I love this verse. This is verse 19 and that he will set you high above all nations which he has made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you, are, you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. A consecrated people to God as he has spoken. Be holy because I am holy. In fact, the New Testament again repeats this concept. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 and 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, coincidentally, they, they have the same chapter and the same verse. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, and 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Colossians, this is the New Testament, it says here, Colossians, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. As you receive Jesus, as I have received Jesus, we are to walk in Him. And then John says, that was the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle John says basically the same thing. 1 John 2, verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Be holy as I'm holy. Walk as I walk. Talk as I talk. Act as I act. It's follow the leader. We've all played that game when we were kids. There's a leader and you jump on the chair and you jump over here and you hop, skip and jump and run over here and you go around this tree. We've all played follow the leader before, right? Or leapfrog, etc. You follow the leader. This is the concept that is equal in throughout the Old Testament and, and flows over like flowing, like a flowing river into the New Testament. Walk as I walk, God says. Be holy because I'm holy. You believe in me? then act like you believe in me. Live like you believe in me. And these are what both apostles are saying, both Paul and John. If you believe in Jesus, then walk in Jesus. Walk like he walked. Be holy as God is holy. This is God's special treasure. It's you, my friend. It's me. You are God's treasure. You are his possession. And because God has saved us, and he has done marvelous things in our lives and continues to do so. He is asking you with open arms and with love, obey my voice, be a kingdom of priests in this world, and walk holy, live in holiness. What is God's treasure? It's his people, those who have made a covenant relationship with him to follow him, to love him, and to obey him. In concluding this morning, God's people, as I said, are called to be priests. In other words, to make known who God is in the world. Not only through our words and through Bible studies and, and posting things on Facebook, good Bible things on Facebook, but it's through our character witness. If God were to take away your sight, and if God were to take away your vocal cords, and if God were to take away your hearing so that your words are taken away, everything is taken away, then the only thing that people would go on by who you are is how you act. They couldn't go by your words. They couldn't go by what you are looking at. The only thing they can go by is who you are as a person. 
I'm wondering if sometimes it would be a blessing if God were to take away our eyes and our voice or something, because how are we using, as the Apostle Paul says, do not use the members of your body in acts of sin. That's what he says in the book of Galatians and in the book of Romans. But God's people are called to be priests, make known who God is in the world, and God's people are called to be partakers of his divine nature. In other words, to walk in the holiness, to walk circumspect lives. In fact, Peter says that in 2 Peter chapter 2. He says, through these glorious and great promises of God, we can actually be partakers of his divine nature. Not becoming divine ourselves, but assimilating those divine attributes in our character. Unlike treasures we may have at home in the garage or in the safe, or in the closet, in a bank, where these treasures indeed have value, but they just sit in the dark. God's treasure is a living treasure. You and I, we're alive. That's what His treasure is. And unlike treasures, we may have that, uh, unlike treasures, we may have that, uh, they may change because of our changing outlooks and what we deem as important. God's treasure has never changed. He has never changed what he values as most important and crucial, and that's people. He doesn't, with the passing of thousands of years, God doesn't change his mind. You know, I've matured a little bit now. Now, you know, I don't keep certain things as my treasured possession. I, I think I'm developing and I'm moving on to bigger and better things. That's not God. His treasure has always been the same. It's been people. And the thing I like about God's treasure, his possession, people, live people, you and me, is that he wants to spend time with his treasure. Does he not? He doesn't just create a treasure and leave it on its own. That's why the Bible says it's like a golden thread throughout Scripture. Way back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, the Bible says in the book of Genesis. And then in the book of Exodus, where we're at, in chapter 25, verse 8, God says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God is, it's his noble obsession to be with his possession, to be with his treasure. I want to be with him. And then, of course, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, and I will be their God, and I will dwell with them and them with me. There will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It is God's noble obsession to be with his treasured possession all throughout Scripture. God treasures you. God treasures me. God treasures us. And when God calls people through his Spirit, in our consciences, that soft wooing of God's voice. He will not only treasure us always, but he has an immense treasure stored up for those that belong to God, and it is beyond anything, beyond our wildest imagination. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says this, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. He's got... We're his treasure, but he's got amazing treasures in store for us. We are God's treasure. So won't you respond to him, to his call, to his blessing and his challenge for you to live a life for him, a life that means salvation, a life that means fulfillment, a life that means truth, a life that means peace and immortality in a perfect, beautiful world world. I want to make that invitation to you. 
if you have your treasures at home, whatever they look like, I want you to tell yourself, remind yourself, you, your being, you are God's treasure. You are a special possession. And he is calling you to be his, to walk like he walked, to dedicate your heart and your mind and your soul to him. I want to make that invitation. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. You'll never regret it. Jesus will come into your heart. He will replace those feelings of guilt and shame. He can replace it with peace and forgiveness. Instead of an empty vacuum feeling in your heart that you don't know what your life is about, Jesus will give you that fulfillment and show you this is what life is really about. You'll have a sense of purpose, a sense of direction in life if only you invite Jesus in your heart today. I want to invite you to invite Jesus in your heart. You're his own special possession. Unfortunately, many will say no to God, will say no to Jesus. And there will be a judgment day. It's not that God wants people to be lost. He's interested in populating heaven. God is interested in numbers and he is interested in you because you are his personal treasured possession. Accept him. Accept his call. See his hands reaching out to you. I want to make that invitation to you today. And for those of you who are here present, I know that you've accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. I want to extend the invitation to us here to say to God this morning, God, I always want to be your treasured possession. I want to be yours forever and ever and ever. If that's your wish, I invite you to stand up at this moment. And I invite you to stand up where you are at home. If you have accepted this invitation, wherever you are, I want you to stand up and I want you to pray with me at this moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much because we know what God's treasure is. We've discovered it this morning. It is people, regardless of race, regardless of culture, of skin color, of language, of dialect, of gender. People, people, God, are your special treasure. God, I want to pray for those who have accepted this invitation to be your special treasure. I pray, Jesus, that you will forgive us of our sins. We are all in the same boat in this. We're all sinners and we need a Savior. And Jesus, I pray that you will forgive those who are listening, who have their heads bowed. Some of them are crying right now and feeling your Holy Spirit working on their hearts wooing them to repentance and to ask forgiveness. And Lord, I know that it is your love that brings us to repentance. It's not your threats. It's not the threats of a hell. It's not the threats of a punishment. It is your love and kindness that touches our hearts. I know hearts are being touched right now as I speak, Jesus. So minister to them. Tell them how special they are to you. Tell us how special special of a treasure we are to you, God. Thank you so much. Help us, God, to be your priests and a holy nation in this world. <clears throat> Especially now, God, where people may be thinking strange thoughts about you because of this pandemic. Especially now when people are stressed out and maybe don't have a sense of direction or peace. May we be your special possession as priests and a holy nation in this world. Minister to those who have just accept, accepted you, God. Touch their hearts. Live in their hearts and direct their lives from here on forward. It's not easy, God. Christianity is not for cowards. But we know that you give us power and strength to resist our arch enemy and our natural tendencies to go towards what is wrong. Give us those people, give us that strength, give us your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. May the Lord, as Numbers chapter 6 says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. You are God's special possession and his treasure. Don't forget it. 
Next week, we will continue our live streaming, but we will be here live. I'm going to invite, in fact, next week, Robert, just scan the crowd. We have no idea how many people will be here next week in our sanctuary, but just keep that in mind. We will be reopening next Sabbath on May 30. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath.